This is Dr. Bess Miller, and I'm here with Dr. Nathan Schaefer. Today's date is October 1st, 2018, and we are in Atlanta, Georgia at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I am interviewing Dr. Schaefer as part of the Oral History Project, The Early Years of AIDS, CDC's Response to a Historic Epidemic, the PEPFAR Years. We are here to discuss your experience during the early years of CDC's work on PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Dr. Schaefer, do I have your permission to interview you and to record this interview? Yes, you do. Nathan, you've been a leader in the field of prevention of mother-to-child HIV transmission, so-called PMTCT, since early days. The landmark study of short course AZT for PMTCT, which you led in collaboration with Thai researchers, was a watershed event and allowed for affordable, broad-based scale-up of this life-saving intervention in developing countries. Throughout your career, you've been a leader at CDC, at WHO, and other UN agencies in research, program implementation, evaluation, and guideline development in the fields of PMTCT and pediatric HIV in countries throughout Africa and Asia. You were the CDC lead for the Mother to Child Transmission Initiative before PEPFAR, and then as a critical leader for PEPFAR at CDC, you started and developed the CDC Global AIDS Program PMTCT strategy and team and embarked on early implementation in PEPFAR-supported countries. More recently, you've played a lead role in the development of the EMTCT, dedicated to elimination of maternal-to-child HIV transmission. We have a lot to discuss. But first, let's begin with your background. Would you tell me about where you grew up and your early family life? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, I grew up in uh, just outside of New York City and basically uh, spent my early years in the New York area and um, went, to, went to college at uh, Yale College in Connecticut and studied, uh, although I had a strong science background, I actually studied philosophy and the humanities and was not really geared towards uh, medical school when I finished college. And I took uh, two years off doing a variety of different jobs. And then I actually had to go back to school to, uh, to do my pre-med courses. I decided that I did want to go into medicine and potentially into public health. I was very interested in that. So uh, I, went to, uh, I was able to go to Columbia College um, a School of Medicine. What did and, interest yeah. you in, med in going into medicine? How did that take place? Uh, I, I, as I thought about what I wanted to do as a professional career, I was really very interested in um, first having direct contact with other people, working, working broadly with other professionals, but really kind of making a difference. And I appreciated uh, the importance of, of health uh, for, on, on an individual level and a social level, and health as a um, as a right of, of people. So I was very interested in some of the uh, social and justice issues in terms of access to health. And uh, I was interested in, in the science uh, of it, but I think I wanted, I was looking for something in terms of a service profession. So medical school would have been in, in the 80s? Yes, I, I finished medical school in 1982. And now, then, when you were in medical school and then internship and residency, did you see much AIDS at that time, early AIDS and then more definitive AIDS? Uh, yes, uh, it, that was just at the cusp, as, as you know very well, the, uh, the first uh, st uh, uncharacterized cases um, uh, were beginning to be seen in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And my recollection is that I, in retrospect, saw a few cases as a medical student in New York City. Um, I did a lot of work at Harlem Hospital 
in New York, and that um, subsequently became kind of an epicenter. And so, in retrospect, both some of the uh, fulminant TB cases, some of the unclear pneumonia cases, and uh, just the wasting diseases that I saw as a medical student um, clearly were AIDS. It was more clear when I was a resident. I did my residency in internal medicine at Boston City Hospital, big city hospital, where uh, it served a lot of immigrants, a lot of uh, um, people with drug problems and, um, and, and others. And I remember very distinctly seeing people that seemed to be characterized with, um, seemed to have this unknown illness that then we put together and, and reading from the reports from CDC, we realized was, was HIV. Or, or AIDS at the time. I also did a clinical clerkship, I think it must have been in 1981, out at San Francisco General Hospital uh, on the GI service. And uh, I, again, I didn't know it at the time, but I think almost every single person that I saw there had a complaint probably related to, to AIDS at the time. So Do it was- Do you remember uh, some, of the, yeah. some of the illnesses that you saw during your residency? Uh, were you seeing a lot of pneumocystis? Uh... Uh, we, we, we did see pneumocystis. We saw Kaposi sarcoma. We, uh, uh, what, what, but what actually struck me, and, and I still have some reflect on this now and then, uh, young men in primary care clinic who were presenting with um, lymphadenopathy and we couldn't really characterize what it was, and it was before it was well appreciated that this was a prodrome for, uh, for HIV and AIDS. And there actually were articles written at the time of idiopathic lymphadenopathy of both unknown consequence, but we kind of dismissed it at the time and just uh, asked people to come for follow-up. And because this was a big city hospital, uh, we didn't necessarily have such good follow-up of some of these episodic cases of, of young men. And that, aside from the very fulminant, very dramatic bad cases, and I did see uh, quite a number of people die in the hospital from end-stage AIDS. But what really stuck with me were uh, young men in particular. I didn't really, we didn't appreciate all the the social and behavioral risks. We didn't necessarily get into all of that, but just understanding their presentations. And uh, we didn't, I wish we knew more at the time and I wish we could have helped them um, more than we did. And we didn't really understand what we were seeing at those early times. But I think that in general, as a resident from 82 to 85 in internal medicine at a big, big city hospital, uh, uh, there was a significant amount of uh, HIV disease. So then, how did you get interested in public health? Well, I, um, I, was, I was in the primary care medicine track, and I was working uh, when I had time available at a number of community health centers. And actually, my career path at the time, I thought I was going to work in primary care. There was a big move movement to support community health centers and to provide more access to uh, people that were underserved. And, uh, and I worked during my residency, and then after residency, I worked for a year at two primary health care centers in the Boston area, serving primarily immigrant and uh, inner city communities. But at the same time, even during my residency, I had some contact with CDC, and I was particularly influenced by two infectious disease, both infectious disease and uh, sexually transmitted disease doctors who had connections with CDC. One of them had been at the CDC and the other was working closely with CDC and uh, they both talked about it and encouraged me to think about it. And uh, then I think it was still when I was a resident, uh, there was a, um, there, there was a, uh, uh, a talk of some visiting people from CDC and there were several people from CDC that came up to Boston and I attended it. I remember Art Reingold was one of the people uh, who came up and was promoting uh, the EIS, and I didn't really know too much about it and was really very interested and followed up and looked into that and applied. And uh, I really had two pathways. Either I was going to continue in primary care medicine 
or come down to the CDC. I decided to come to CDC thinking that I really needed um, my, my experience up to that point. My training was really all clinical and I needed to, uh, while I was interested in public health, I needed to learn something about public health and epidemiology. And I've, I've often been struck as well. I'm very grateful that CDC accepted me into, ED, into EIS. I know my, um, uh, I had strong clinical credentials and strong interest, but um, compared to the credentials that people have these days, I wonder whether I would have gotten into EIS now. But uh, be that as it may, I thought I would come back down to CDC to EIS for two years and then continue with my primary care public health work. But I knew also that I had an interest in, in global health and international health, and um, that certainly took off when I came to CDC. Tell us more about that. Uh, had you done any international travel uh, for, for other reasons? or uh, Only personal reasons. I had done a fair amount of travel on my own, exploring things. It was a time of uh, a, a lot of people were traveling. Um, in the 1970s and 80s and uh, uh, in a more carefree way. But I had traveled a bit in uh, Mexico and South America, and I had not been to Africa. But I, had, uh, I was just very interested in world events and uh, exploring new places and very aware of public health problems, particularly in, in, in Africa. So I was interested, but I think it was more theoretical and untested. Mm -hmm. So then you got to CDC, and, and where were you assigned for your ES, EIS fellowship, and, and what did you do? Yeah, I was in the uh, what was called at the time the enteric diseases branch, or the diarrheal diseases ba uh, bacterial branch. And I was um, assigned for surveillance systems to look at uh, diarrheal diseases like salam salmonella and shigella uh, um, and botulism and cholera. And I had opportunities to uh, travel and investigate uh, different chronic diarrheal conditions, both in the uh, Indian Health Service and the southwest of the United States, um, botulism outbreaks among Native Americans in Alaska. And the first time I went to Africa, I investigated a cholera outbreak in Guinea-Bissau in West Africa. And that was my first introduction, uh, quite a dramatic one, to uh, in, in a very poor country in Africa. Why did why did you cho did you choose bacterial diseases? It was a very competitive spot. Um, do you remember why you chose that? It, it had the reputation. Uh, first of all, as a very congenial group, uh, to be sure, um, with good supervision. But it had a reputation of having a lot of opportunities for. Uh, outbreak investigations and very good, uh, clear methodologies for the kind of um, EIS training that one looked for at, at CDC. So then after EIS, you didn't leave, you ended up in the malaria branch. Yeah. Um, how did that happen? And, and I, I was looking to stay on at, uh, at CDC. I was interested, among, among other diseases, in malaria. I think at that point I already was beginning to be more interested in HIV and AIDS as well. Um, but I was able to take a one-year assignment in the malaria branch for some additional training. And that got me, I probably spent half of the year in Africa um, with the malaria branch. And that was very, very formative, uh, both in terms of learning about malaria, because it's kind of one of the things about CDC. You get put into a position, everyone assumes you're an expert. I really didn't know anything about malaria at the time. And uh, at the home base, I just spent a lot of time learning how to read malaria slides and doing finger pricks and doing all of that and learning some of the, lab of the laboratory. But um, a lot of our work in malaria was at that time there was intense interest in the potential interaction between malaria and HIV. There was even some concern which was uh, which was, didn't pan out at all, fortunately, that uh, malaria or mosquitoes were transmitting some of HIV um, because of where, where uh, HIV seemed to be exploding in Africa. But there was also more concern that people that, the question was, people that were co-infected with malaria, did they have, um, and co-infected with malaria and HIV, did they have 
um, a risk of more severe malaria, or vice versa, would malaria tip uh, to fulminant progression of, of HIV? And so a lot of our field work was actually in Kinshasa, Zaire, mm. uh, now the, uh, the Congo. Um, and as, as you know, there was a, uh, the first CDC international HIV field station was in Kinshasa, um, founded by uh, Jonathan Mann. At that time, Robin Ryder was the head of that. And uh, they, we were very fortunate that they allowed us to use that as a base to do some malaria HIV studies. And so I spent a lot of time at Prochecita in Kinshasa, met a lot of the key early leaders actually in HIV, international HIV in Projecita, and did a number of studies at the main hospital. Uh, I remember you, you, yeah. were, you were looking at, at uh, pediatric HIV, if I recall, in Zaire. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what the scene was like? Were there dying babies? Were there... Uh, what was what was the scenario that when you were there, which was pretty yep. early? Yes, uh, this was in uh, 1988, 89. Uh, what we were really, what we were mostly looking at was the uh, risk of transmission of pregnant women who were HIV positive, um, and the risk of transmission of HIV to the baby, and the interaction with malaria, because pregnant women also were at risk of. Uh, of having clinical malaria and having more severe malaria. And I was actually following up on some studies that uh, one of my predecessors, Alan Greenberg, had started. Uh, and I was basically doing follow-up. And so we did prevalence studies or seroprevalence because we had the test now for HIV screening. And so we could test pregnant women to see what was the, what was the proportion of pregnant women that were positive. Uh, and then Projecida, this was not my work, but Projecida was well known at the time of doing pioneering cohort studies to look at the risk of transmission from mother to baby. So we concentrated just cross-sectionally, just at the prevalence of the disease mm -hmm. and characterizing the uh, severity of disease, particularly malaria in conjunction with HIV. But one of the striking things at that time, Kinshasa was viewed as one of the real hotspots for HIV, and our studies in pregnant women showed they were follow-up, the prevalence was about 5%, which of course in, uh, uh, in our understanding is, seems to be quite high compared to the U.S. situation, but one of our findings was that the prevalence had really not changed, it had not increased from the earlier studies from some of the people, uh, and we use the same methodologies. So one of the one of the intriguing questions always that has uh, been around is why didn't HIV actually get worse in Kinshasa and in the Congo after that time, especially given um, not only the, uh, the beginnings of infection, but also the relatively poor public health and medical infrastructure and the, uh, the civil disruptions that were constantly ongoing at the time. And, uh, but Kinshasa and Zaire, prevalence stayed about the same, and then HIV began to take off in eastern southern Africa in a much more serious way. Uh, one of the people that I met in Kinshasa was Margaret Oxtaby, who was developing a, um, a pediatric and family focus for HIV under Martha Rogers back at CDC. And Margaret and I worked a little bit together in Kinshasa, and she, plant, she basically invited me after my work to, to jo join up in the HIV group and start focusing on mother-to-child transmission and pediatric HIV. So, um, so I made a rapid transition there. So um, just kind of looking at what was known at that time about vertical transmission of AIDS. Were there, there were data from the U.S., Zaire, and elsewhere. What was, what was the understanding at that time? Yeah. So we're looking at 88. Yeah, 88, 89. I think that uh, um, my, my senior supervisor during these early years was Martha Rogers, and she was really one of the leaders in this field. And, uh, and she, uh, 
I, I think if I remember right, the main, we, we understood by then that the transmission risk without any interventions was about 30 or 35 percent, about one out of three pregnant women with HIV would transmit disease. We had a sense, I don't think it was clearly characterized, that women that were more clinically symptomatic and therefore more advanced in their disease uh, would be more likely to transmit. I don't think that we were doing, uh, we didn't appreciate the correlations with CD4 counts and certainly with viral load that came much later. We didn't have it at that time, but uh, s around that time, tests for diagnosis of infection in infants was being developed with PCR. Um, but one of the dilemmas was it was difficult to diagnose HIV in the exposed infant, infants born to infected mothers because the antibody from mothers was persistent in the baby and would interfere with the assay and would persist for about 18 months. Another area of interest and concern, there were strong suspicions that there might be transmission via breastfeeding of mothers, but at that time it was not well characterized. And I think that uh, Martha was one of the lead people that, uh, uh, that studied that and, um, and, and defined that route of transmission. So we knew about the routes of transmission, and, um, but one of the things that went on for a number of years was that we didn't really have any, uh, any way of, of uh, blocking or interrupting, uh, preventing the transmission. And we knew in general that women that were more clinically advanced in their disease would have a higher risk of transmission to their baby. We also knew, quite unfortunately, that the infants that were infected would, um, um, many of them would progress very rapidly in their disease and um, uh, uh, that about 50% of them would not live beyond one year of mm -hmm. age. So were you traveling quite a bit during this period? Um, uh, I actually, um, uh, um, that, that, that was a, a source of uh, uh, some creative tension in the, in, in the family. I was, I was traveling a lot, as I mentioned, about 50% of the time during my malaria time in, in Africa, where I really got quite an introduction both to Africa public health issues and to the uh, HIV epidemic. But I had a young family and I decided in part to take a position back at CDC with Margaret where I could focus on domestic HIV. And Martha had pioneered some studies and developed a cohort in the New York and New Jersey area looking at mother to child transmission of HIV with the New York City Health Department. and. Uh, Polly Thomas and others that uh, were looking at this. And so I said, okay, uh, I've had a great experience doing international work, but maybe I need to focus on domestic work while I had um, uh, was starting a family. So basically worked in, uh, and, and I did some work in Atlanta at Grady Hospital with colleagues here at Emory and Grady. So for two years I was working um, in New York and in Atlanta on domestic studies and I learned about, I learned much more about how to um, manage, run, and analyze data from cohort studies, which involved enrolling and following up HIV positive pregnant women, looking at the risk factors of why some women became positive while others remained negative, what were the, uh, what could we learn about the incidents in terms of which, which age groups were being affected and what behavioral groups were being affected. But then also, by this time, there was a clear PCR test for HIV diagnosis, and we could measure CD4 counts. And so I got very involved with the logistics of transporting overnight blood samples on ice from different study sites to CDC, which was the only reference lab at that point doing CD4 testing and doing PCR testing. And so, so we PCR had- PCR testing for the infants. PCR testing for the infants, and that had been uh, developed by Chin Yeo, who had, and and one of the nice things at that time, I really, as a uh, epidemiologist, I had so much was involved with the laboratory, so I, I really had an opportunity to work very closely with laboratory colleagues at the time. So, can you comment even further on CDC's role in all of this? Um, uh, yeah, what niche 
would you say CDC played and up until the point of, of PEPFAR and uh, in terms of its leadership for HIV AIDS? Uh, I think um, certainly from the early 90s with different studies, CDC was, was a leader in the mother to child area set up by some of my supervisors and because of the cohort studies that had been, that had been established in New York and Atlanta, uh, the, uh, there was a real leadership role there. CDC continued its studies of cohort studies looking at risk factors and, and what we called natural history of mother to child transmission and risk. Those were ongoing in Kinshasa. And then Kevin DeCock started uh, Projet Retrocy in Ivory Coast and was looking at the risk of mother to child transmission in HIV-1 and HIV-2. NIH at the same time, by the early 90s, had really begun to um, uh, focus also on mother to child transmission and they also began to establish cohort studies and put more funding into that. And they then sponsored a study, which we can talk about in a moment, that was really the landmark study in getting everything started um, um, to look at how to interrupt transmission. But I think that C CDC uh, played, played a key role, and, uh, and uh, but what was looking at natural history studies, I think there were guidelines that began to come out from the U.S. Public Health Service on testing, uh, testing pregnant women for HIV and women that were that tested positive were advised not to breastfeed um, at at the time uh, because. How of the, did CDC and NIH work together during these relatively early years? I, I don't have that. <clears throat> I, I wasn't directly part of that, and I was not on any committees or task forces interacting that well. Uh, I think that there was a friendly competition between the two groups, uh, but there was a lot of interaction, particularly on the guidelines. Uh, um, um, uh, and uh, I think that NIH began to focus much more on how to develop interventions and apply some clinical interventions, and CDC continued to look more at, at the epidemiology. Uh, now that changed a little bit. I was in a unique position, even though, if you recall, I said that I wanted to work domestically. Uh, I had an opportunity in 1991, um, yet another field station was being developed in Bangkok, Thailand, under Bruce Weninger, again, to, uh, to look at the what seemed to be an explosive epidemic of HIV in Southeast Asia with an explosion in, um, in Thailand, and prevalence was really rising very quickly. And um, uh, Bruce and, and Margaret encouraged me to think about developing cohort studies in Thailand. And so for actually for two years, I went back and forth to Thailand and developed early na uh, an early natural history cohort study, again, looking at uh, uh, the risk of infection to why mothers acquired infection and what was the risk of infection from mother to baby. And these were some of the same questions, but this was a different subtype of HIV, subtype E. And at that time, it was an important question as to whether different subtypes had the same characteristics, as well as different HIV strains like HIV 1 and 2. So there was a different strain and also were the, the tests that we were using, were they as sensitive to pick up these other subtypes. But in the middle of my, my studies, uh, my natural history studies, NIH in 1994 issued the results of the very famous ACTG 076 study, which was really a, um, a very intense study in the U.S. looking at how to interrupt mother-to-child transmission. And uh, they were very successful at decreasing transmission to about one-third of the risk by giving, at that time, AZT to the mother during pregnancy, intravenous AZT to the mother during uh, labor and delivery, and then giving postpartum 
AZT for six weeks to the baby. And this was viewed as a tr really a breakthrough triumph. It was not only a, a proof of concept that HIV transmission could be interrupted by drugs, but it had practical public health implications in the U.S. At the same time, we were very concerned that it was obvious that most of the burden of disease was in developing countries, and this very elegant, very expensive, and very difficult to administer regimen of the uh, ACTG076 uh, regimens would be difficult, if not impossible, to provide in developing countries. So in the middle of all this, you make a 180 and decide to go to Thailand with your family. How did that come about? How did you convince everyone that that was a good idea? Well, there was, uh, there was exciting work to do there, and I was uh, being uh, welcomed to have an opportunity there. Fortunately, I, um, my wife had actually, who's also an epidemiologist at, at CDC, had worked, in the, uh, had worked in Thailand in the refugee camps when she was a medical student and really had a strong affinity for, uh, for Asia and for Thailand. And she was very uh, encouraging of my getting involved and game for, for picking up the family and having a life experience of moving there. So we literally moved there with a one and a four year old uh, for, a, for truly a family adventure and then my own public health adventure in Thailand. So what was that like getting there and setting up a life in Thailand? Uh, it, was, uh, it was exciting and challenging and uh, very, very fast paced. Uh, it, uh, it was, we, we didn't have much time to prepare basically. We, we physically moved and then I had to start work really immediately and there was really pressure to keep the cohort studies going and soon to move into a clinical trial, which I want to uh, mention. Um, but on a personal level, in terms of the family, there we, we had support. There was a very nice, uh, very my, nice apartment that we could live in. But life in, in Bangkok was complicated uh, in terms of the tremendous or infamous traffic congestion, the time it took to get around, the smog and pollution. Uh, this was, I remember very well, it was before they had moved to unleaded gasoline. The pollution in the air was bad. Uh, they were also tearing up the city because they were building a subway system which was not finished until 1999. So in the whole 1990s, uh, traffic was much worse because city was being torn up to build uh, the subway system and the SkyTrain. But what really stands out is the congenial, congeniality, the support, the, uh, the close relationships among my Thai colleagues, uh, which was just very exciting. We just had a, um, a wonderful uh, working relationship and a personal and friendly, friendly relationship. So I think it was a very, really a very, very nice experience. I um, made a, a lot of lifelong friends there. So uh, what were the terms of reference for this assignment and who was your boss? Uh, initially, before I went over uh, to start some of the cohort studies, I was working with Bruce Weninger who was the first director of the, uh, the, the Thailand project. Uh, and then Tim Mastro took over as the director, and he was there, and I had been working with him a bit, and we were working long distance, and after he had been there about six months, he was able to secure a position for the head of uh, the EPI research unit un under him and he was beginning to staff up the office and hire a number of expats. And so my term of reference was more broadly, it was not just in MTCT, it was uh, to do epi studies on HIV, but with the understanding that I would probably concentrate on mother to child transmission because that was my area and I was already um, had a lot of ongoing work in that. So Tim was my supervisor. Uh, in uh, the whole time that I was in Thailand. Uh, 
in when the ACTG study came out in 1994, we quickly changed gears, looked at that, and with a lot of input, we really had a kind of a think tank uh, brainstorming among key people both at, in Atlanta and, and of course in Thailand to think, could we do another study that actually would look at a simplified intervention that would follow on with the ACTG 076, but would be a feasible intervention for developing country settings, both in terms of the lower cost, the more limited contact and intervention with the patients, something that could be applied in a variety of different settings. So we actually developed a common protocol between Thailand and Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the two CDC field sites, to look at what we call short course AZT, to take the 076 study and to significantly shorten it and simplify it. And so we worked in concert. So can you tell us a little bit about doing this study, not, not the type of things that are in the method, method sections of manuscripts, but what did it take to do this study in, in Thailand where you were and, and then in Cote d'Ivoire? Yeah. Uh, were the were the Thai colleagues very interested in this? Were were the cohorts the base that you started with? How did you do this? Yes. Well, first we had a big advantage because we had done uh, a cohort, a natural history cohort study, and we were working out of two really big hospitals in Bangkok, one a university hospital and one the largest ministry hospital. And these were both very impressive, very large, very well-run institutions with uh, good clinical and academic leaders. And they both had uh, a very large number of births a year, much bigger than the average hospital in the U.S., I think in the range of 10 to 15,000 or even more births per year. Uh, the Thai colleagues, the Thai co-investigators were uh, really f very, very engaged and very motivated. They saw HIV as directly affecting their country uh, um, and um, being an important threat, and they wanted to participate in both studying it and come up with some practical solutions. There also was, uh, uh, they had already made real advances, um, building on their interventions for sexually transmitted diseases, they already had pioneered um, screening and testing of pregnant women for HIV and doing counseling and uh, particularly doing group counseling uh, for, for women. So there was, there was great interest. Um, personally, what was very exciting was that I, I wasn't just sitting in my office uh, and certainly not just sitting behind a computer most of the time. I was back and forth to the hospitals a couple of times a week interacting with people, going on the wards, going into the labor room, looking over the log books, designing different forms, and reviewing, uh, reviewing the progress of the study on a weekly basis. And I put a lot of effort into kind of building a team um, and a team approach with the colleagues at the hospital and with my research assistants, and that was, that was great. Can you tell us a little bit about um, maternal and child health uh, services at that time in, in Bangkok were, um, did most women get antenatal care? Were most births in the hospital or in rural, or in more rural settings or at home? Um, what was it, how did you access patients? Uh, yes, we, in the urban center, uh, virtually all deliveries took place in hospitals. Though all, there already was a large private sector in Bangkok, which has continued, but uh, the two hospitals that we worked at were very prestigious, and many women sought those out. So uh, uh, prenatal care was well organized. Women came relatively early to prenatal care and uh, stayed in follow-up, and then came for postpartum vi visit. As in many developing countries, there is a phenomenon of uh, after the delivery, particularly many of the younger women would go, uh, it was called to go up country to go back to their um, home of origin, usually with their, with their parents and live for a couple of months. So in some cases, it might be hard to follow up 
on um, mothers or families. Now you chose to stay in the urban areas. Yeah. Was, did you give consideration to looking at the more complex rural settings for this study? Uh, we didn't at the time. We basically wanted to, uh, uh, the logistics were somewhat challenging already and we wanted to uh, focus on having good data, well-controlled data in uh, well-defined settings and we felt that we could do that uh, rapidly in the urban settings. We thought that since we were looking at a biological issue of transmission that the results really would be generalizable to, to rural areas. The question I think that you raise, which is a good one, is that the behavior patterns, the, the accessibility, and the level of health care might be very different in rural areas. And that would be uh, something that was followed up on afterwards. But in general, Thailand, um, while it was still considered a developing country, really had very, very good systems in place and had good maternal child health systems. One of the nice things was that uh, there, uh, there was the uh, obstetricians, the pediatricians, and the infectious disease doctors were really all uh, interested and in working on HIV together mm -hmm. at the time. Now, if, if I remember correctly, this was a placebo-controlled trial. Yeah. Um, even after ACTG had shown sort of proof of principle. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I know that was there was concerns from an ethical standpoint of, of using a placebo at this stage in history. Yeah, uh, that, that certainly became a flash point. Uh, when we developed the protocol, uh, there were really very little concerns raised about using placebo, and the rationale was that we were really doing a very different intervention even though the ACTG study had shown their results, those, that intervention was not being used anywhere in Thailand and certainly anywhere in developing countries, and there was no proposal to use that. It just simply was not feasible. And the rationale behind uh, placebo or uh, of using a placebo in, this, in the clinical trial was that we could look at the effect, potential benefit of the short course AZT in a very rapid, relatively small study and, um, and look to see whether it would have any benefit. And at that time, again, going through the IRBs, we really didn't know at all whether the short course AZT that we were using, which was four weeks of AZT to the mother and, and, uh, and during labor, um, um, would have a benefit. So from the point of view of IRBs, there was felt to be equipoise about that. It was, it was legitimately an open question. Uh, as the study continued, uh, there was a big, there were outside criticisms, criticisms that were very heavy leveled against us uh, as investigators and leveled against CDC for doing a placebo-controlled trial. But I, I must say that uh, we did have a lot of discussions internally at CDC about it, and I certainly received a lot of support from CDC for this. Our studies were designed to be finished relatively rapidly, and one of the benefits was that not only was this looking at a short course of AZT, but it was a short study design. And again, because of the powerful uh, diagnostic tools, we could get end results very quickly in the baby. So we were literally able to, uh, to do the study uh, from start to finish in about two years. And uh, fortunately, we had very, very strong results showing that the, strong, that the short course AZT was also effective in reducing the risk by about 50%. Once those results came out, uh, the concerns and the criticism about placebo um, died out, uh, lessened, and the focus of attention very rightly shifted from uh, what was the proper study to design to how could we implement that. One of the strong points about the study, again, we did in conjunction with the Ministry of Health in Thailand was that they, they said as part of the protocol that if the study were successful, that they would then implement 
the results and use this as the public health approach. So it was not just a kind of an academic study uh, on behalf of CDC, but it was really a very meaningful study uh, for the Thai investigators and for the Thai ministry. And true to, true to word, as soon as the results were published, then the Thai Ministry of Health uh, focused on implementing that as a public health program. How, what do you, how was CDC received in Thailand during those years? What, was, what were the feelings, good, bad, about CDC's presence in Thailand? I think CDC was, was very well received. We were literally on the Ministry of Health campus. Um, we had a lot of interaction with ministry people. There were one or two people from the ministry that were seconded to our office, and we collaborated on a lot of things. I think that, uh, as in many countries, the, uh, the Thai ministry wanted to do things on their own. They didn't want to be overly reliant at all, but there had already been a, uh, a training program, the FETP, in Thailand, and there was a lot of comfort, uh, not only comfort, but familiarity and interest in what CDC could bring. There was also an appreciation, particularly our CDC office had a very, very strong laboratory, and uh, the laboratory did a lot of training um, in HIV for uh, laboratorians in Thailand, so there was a real appreciation of the um, the technological uh, training and knowledge that, that that brought. So I think CDC was was very well respected within the ministry and its role was appreciated and uh, uh, and, and I'm, ju I'm just reflecting that we, we worked primarily with the ministry. We didn't really necessarily work with other NGOs and, uh, and UN organizations. I think that our primary focus and the appreciation, it was really set up as a collaboration with the Ministry of Health. And that actually kind of um, anticipates an approach uh, that the CDC took in terms of its later work with PEPFAR as well. So CDC and, and the U.S. government overall had made fairly minimal efforts in addressing global AIDS prior to 1999. And then things began to change in late 1999. President Clinton la launched the so-called LIFE Initiative, Leadership in Fighting an Epidemic, a U.S. government HIV AIDS initiative where approximately $100 million was set aside for HIV AIDS. And then in 2002, President Bush pledged a $500 million interagency initiative to prevent mother-to-child HIV transmission in Africa and the Caribbean. By this time, you were team leader of the prevention of mother-to-child HIV transmission team in the Global AIDS Program at CDC. Can you tell us a little bit about this initiative? This was um, the beginning of something very large that was coming to you and your colleagues. Yes, um, th thank you for the reminder of the sequence of, uh, of those times uh, because a lot was happening uh, quickly. The, um, the, the, the LIFE initiative, which really gave support to the, uh, the CDC Global Global AIDS effort included support for mother-to-child transmission, and that clearly was uh, part of the opportunity because of the Thai short course AZT study, similar results which were obtained in, uh, in Ivory Coast and elsewhere, and the single-dose nevirapine trials that, uh, the, that were done soon after in Uganda. There was tremendous effort and interest on implementing practical, inexpensive interventions to interrupt mother-to-child transmission. So that was clearly, that was one of the opportunities for actually treat, uh, prophylaxis or treatment and intervention that could be done. So out of the LIFE initiative, as you mentioned, the MTCT initiative came. And if I remember right, that was a $500 million mandate specifically or opportunity to, uh, to fund treatment interventions to interrupt transmission. Uh, and this was 
came out of Washington. It came out of the White House. I, I don't know all of the politics involved, but I had the privilege of being basically one of the point people at CDC for that. And while I was doing my technical work, I was actually going up to Washington about every two weeks to meet um, with the people developing the MTCT initiative. And one of the key leaders in that, uh, one of my liaisons in Washington was Mark Dybal, who eventually became the head of PEPFAR and now is the head of the Global Fund. And I worked very closely with him on that. And the concept was, and this was uh, developed by, uh, and this was really a collaboration with uh, the White House, uh, the initiative, NIH, uh, other agencies in Washington and CDC to put together, and there, I think there were several different le levels. One was to develop an organizational level. I should mention also USAID was a very key part of this. The organizational level of what this MTCT initiative was and then how to implement it. And during this time, uh, very, very quickly, uh, well, the, the idea was, was mandated that there would be focus countries, I think about 13 or 15 focus countries in Africa, a few in the Caribbean, that would be defined as the priority countries for the intervention. And we had to come up with how we would develop implementation plans and funding plans and partnerships to implement the program. And it was an extremely exciting but extremely pressurized time uh, to focus on this, uh, and uh, we developed, I'm not sure if I should take, uh, if, if it's good to take credit for this, but uh, my colleagues and myself uh, developed the infamous COP, the Country Operational Plan for countries which uh, has had many iterations since in the development of PEPFAR, but we uh, basically developed the idea that there should be background statement for the country, in this case very specifically on, on mother-to-child transmission, what was the situation, what were the opportunities for interventions, what were the key interventions, and then what would be the, uh, the roles of the different agencies and the funding um, plans on a year-by-year -year basis. And we developed a rapid accountability to develop um, implementation plans with funding and then to evaluate on a yearly basis how we were doing and to do this in partnership with the ministry. And this was done very, primarily very closely between CDC and USAID with a very small central office in Washington. And we got the program off the ground. There was a lot of support for it. It was very exciting and, um, uh, and then really after about a year and a half of doing this, the full PEPFAR was announced with, uh, that was really comprehensive. It was no longer just MTCT, and MTCT would be a part of the much larger PEPFAR initiative. And so my role and our, our role in the, uh, in the PMTCT group was to lead the, that section of now a much larger PEPFAR effort. So can you just shed some light on what the situation was on the ground in, let's say, many of these African countries in terms of mother-to-child service delivery and how are you going to get an intervention, AZT, to, in the, in the end stages of pregnancy, to patients, what, was, what, what were some of the challenges in, in trying to make that happen? Uh, the, uh, there were a lot of challenges, but, f but fortunately there was a, a lot of interest um, in all of the priority MTCT and PEPFAR countries. The challenges really go to the heart of how do you deliver an intervention in the MCH setting and, and added on. So it really depends on the strength of the MCH setting. And we talked before about how strong the MCH infrastructure was in Thailand. So it was relatively easy, not only to do a study, but relatively easy to roll out a very solid intervention on those structures. In the priority countries in Africa and, 
and in the Caribbean, to, but primarily in Africa, the, first of all, the prevalence was much, much higher. We're talking about um, pregnant women being infected at rates of anywhere from four or five percent to as high as 25 or 30 percent. So the numbers were just staggering in terms of the need. Um, many women came late to antenatal care. Uh, the structures in terms of organizing antenatal care were more limited, and uh, you ha one had to just sort of think through the whole sequence of how you implement an intervention, starting from testing of mothers and having quality testing done to having the drugs on site, first of all, having appropriate counseling, having the drugs on site to give to the pregnant women, monitoring the women, and then following up the babies. So each country presented different challenges and were at different stages, but all of the countries were, were, were interested. We did a lot of our early work in Botswana, which is one of the, and still is, one of the most heavily affected uh, countries. And uh, my first EIS officer in the PEPFAR program, Tracy Creek, uh, really spent half of her time in Botswana, and uh, we worked to support her there, and she did a fantastic job of helping to put in place program plans to scale up the PMTCT program. Botswana, while heavily infected, uh, was very committed as a government to implementing programs, and so we had a lot of support from them to do that. What is involved in scaling up a service like that um, in terms of urban and rural and infrastructure strengthening? I, I think it starts first from, um, and, and still very much does, from the central level in terms of commitment. There has to be political commitment uh, and, and clear policies. And in all of these countries, the actual written policies, you can't just come in as a outside government agencies or an NGO and says, hey, this is the best practice. Countries rely on what are the policies of the Ministry of Health and the circulars and directives. So a lot of the background work was really working with the Ministries of Health to develop policies. And again, starting from the, uh, the building blocks of the program to implement routine uh, testing of pregnant women, just as syphilis testing was recommended, just as hemoglobin testing was recommended to implement HIV testing with appropriate counting, uh, uh, with appropriate counseling, with appropriate, hopefully, human rights safeguards and uh, taking steps for non-stigmatization. Uh, also, we even back then began to encourage partner testing for HIV. So putting in place uh, and putting the policies in place for testing, counseling, providing the drug, and the follow-up that was needed. I think that from, again, from an outside group coming in, what we do, part of our role, both as CDC and some of our partner organizations, were really to work to understand each country, I said that the countries were different, appreciate strengths and weaknesses of different countries and what were, how, the, how best to do the implementation in those countries. So uh, we spent a lot of time in hospitals and our partners that we were funding spent time working, providing side-by-side -side technical assistance to understand how could the systems work, given the overall infrastructures, how, how could we integrate our, uh, the HIV PMTCT interventions within existing infrastructures. Early on, we sponsored, CDC sponsored and developed a uh, training curriculum that we, that we rolled out to many, many countries and held many training sessions and adapted those training curriculums to local countries and into local languages. That was a big effort once we had the policies in place. And again, our lab colleagues worked on the quality control of the lab side. So there was, by this time, the countries had developed their own in-country CDC offices. Mm -hmm. uh, so Botswana had yeah. uh, a CDC office. 
Um, what was, how was CDC perceived when PEPFAR started kind of moving into countries in Africa, setting up offices, um, taking a very, very on the ground role in implementing? How was CDC viewed as you were doing this beginning of this initiative? I, I had the opportunity and the privilege of really working with many, many uh, program managers and many Ministry of Health officials in different countries. And I think, in general, our work was really very well appreciated. And when I went to country that was, that was uh, already, the, the, the pathway was absolutely smoothed out and the groundwork laid by the CDC country office and the people living in country. Uh, so that was a, a key part of things to have people on the, on the ground. I think that there was always some issue, uh, uh, which you always have in public health when people are flying in internationally for one or two weeks making recommendations and leaving, um, that can be a bit problematic. But I think the fact that we had people at, in the CDC office that were there fo followed up knew the situation, that was a strength. Our partners, uh, particularly the Columbia MTCT Plus program, the EGPATH program, um, and other implementing partners that we funded also developed very quickly in-country offices so that they had credibility um, on the ground. I think the unique role uh, that I've often reflected on, and I think it was part of the mandate, that CDC had in terms of the partnership of different agencies was CDC always funded with a cooperative agreement directly to the ministries of health. So part of that was capacity building and technical support to the ministry. So part of CDC's role was to support the ministry. There are some dangers in public health projects where you have NGOs that have a lot of money that develop beautiful demonstration projects that are not linked to the public health system. So in th I think in that regard, CDC was well, uh, well appreciated. There were, there were, um, there were concerns be because of some of the, the, the uh, HIV was, had a lot of different overlays. I think that some countries like South Africa and Zimbabwe early on were uncomfortable with uh, some aspects of the, both the CDC role, but more importantly, with the world focus on those countries and expectations. There were early um, concerns that, that the HIV approaches that were being developed by so-called Western countries were, were um, not appropriate to South Africa and Zimbabwe and that uh, we were actually, uh, and then there were crazy theories that we were involved with, w with spreading HIV. But I think that that was pretty quickly overcome. So I think in general, uh, the PEPFAR program was very well accepted. CDC role was recognized, particularly to have a direct strength and strengthening with ministries of health and with lab. And CDC also was respected for its focus on data. Was cost a factor in um, getting AZT to the moms, um, or by this time, was AZT relatively inexpensive? Uh, both AZT and or, or single dose nevirapine were used at the time, depending on different settings and what the capacity was. Cost had come down very, very quickly, uh, and. Um, so, so cost was less of a factor in terms of the drugs. The, really, the cost was the infrastructure involved. And, and actually, if you looked at it, it was the, it was the testing and the follow-up. Those costs were more. But, uh, but, but the, so, so the costs continued to come down in those early years and were less of a factor. Now, we focused on very short course interventions in the, in the early days, 2002, 2003. But one of the big challenges in Africa, and we knew it then, was breastfeeding transmission, and we were not offering 
anything to intervene in terms of breastfeeding transmission. We also knew that uh, while our strategy focused on giving a drug to mothers very late in pregnancy, if we didn't access those mothers um, until extremely late, that would be difficult. And there was, there was also a risk of transmission earlier in the pregnancy, so maybe we should have more expanded interventions. WHO at the time began to be convening expert guidelines, committees, and reviews, and there was a lot of research going on in those early 2000 years looking, looking at interventions that could still be cost-effective, cheap to implement, but would cover more of the risk period for mother-to-child transmission. So one of the challenges technically, which uh, was a incredibly exciting, but also ch challenging to keep up with, was that there was new information literally every six months on what to do. So what we adopted as a simple standard of care was superseded by new guidelines mm -hmm. coming out of WHO and more complex regimens. Um, and literally every two years there was a new guideline from WHO. So while this was exciting and uh, very, promising on, uh, very promising on paper, it required a lot of ongoing work to do retraining, to work with countries to develop their own country guidelines and to implement broader programs. What, what were some of the countries, I know 80% um, or more of the population is rural. Um, what was the approach to uh, rural moms who might deliver at home? Yeah. Or ideally have a traditional birth attendant? Yeah. yeah. I remember with uh, one of my uh, colleagues who had done some of, uh, fr from Cote d'Ivoire, who had uh, been a co-investigator on the short course AZT study in Cote d'Ivoire, we particularly, we, we went out for a couple of days to a rural area in Ivory Coast, and we met with traditional birth attendants and, we re and, and, and tribal leaders in the community. And it was really a, an incredible experience just to talk, appreciate what, uh, what giving birth was like and what kind of care was like. And we, to, to use the example of single-dose nevirapine, which is just a one-time pill at the time of uh, labor, and then another pill to the mother just postpartum and, and one dose to the baby, the idea was that, uh, the proposal was that the traditional birth attendants could carry this as part of their TBA kit and give this to the mother in a simplified form, even if they were delivering at home. And uh, this seemed relatively simple, but I'm not sure whether this ever really worked out for a number of reasons. First, if the mother was in a rural area, she still needed to be tested first. You still needed to know who was HIV positive and who was negative. One of the issues was, was uh, disclosure in these small rural communities, um, and maybe the TBA might have been a relative or certainly close to the, uh, the, uh, the, the chatter of the community. How do you protect the confidentiality of a, of a mother who is HIV positive? Um, to give this targeted intervention. The other is that in different communities, um, in different countries, the status of TBAs, there was a broad range of officially credentialed to not very official, and countries were all also pushing towards having more facility, uh, facility deliveries. And there was a, a schism in terms of thinking about, about whether we should really endorse and promote more interventions through TBAs versus supporting facility-based deliveries. We put a lot of effort into that and we provided guidance on a simple TBA pack, but I'm not sure that that ever worked out. But uh, your question really points out that we really were, uh, the situation in rural areas is very different than a large urban hospital, but one of the one of the underlying premises for the um, MTCT interventions was that the simplified intervention really could be scaled up and um, provided in rural areas and down to the health center 
level. You usually have provincial hospitals, district hospitals, small health centers, and at the, even at the small health centers, there you would have assisted deliveries within a uh, health clinic structure. And I, I myself and my team uh, and, and our colleagues in country spent um, a lot of time going to different facilities at the health center level, checking to see what was feasible, were the SOPs, standard operating procedures, were they on the wall, were all the supplies in place, was the record of keeping in place, and was this feasible to do? And we felt that it, um, it, it really was, and it really was integrated clearly within the MCH structure, and it was prioritized, and it was partly able to be prioritized because the prevalence was so high. Again, between 5% and 25% of the women had HIV, in Africa, and so this was, everyone recognized that this was one of the biggest health problems that had to be addressed for pregnant women. I remember uh, seeing some of those health centers and I was astounded what, usually there were two staff there, and what they could do in terms of doing HIV voluntary counseling and testing, counseling, testing, and then treating, it was just, Astounding. Um, in terms of the healthcare personnel needed to implement this uh, initiative, um, was this a situation where you needed to scale down and do task shifting? Were nurses doing doing the, the screening and treating? Uh, how was this managed from the, and we know in many countries there was a shortage of healthcare workers. So how was that approached? Yeah. Uh, uh, training, 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 and uh, always a need for more, more staff. The, the, I think in every country that we worked in, we, uh, that was the biggest complaint and concern that was voiced that this, there weren't enough healthcare workers and that they were overbur overburdened already. But I think that there, as I said, there was really a recognition that HIV had to be included and we tried to make things as simple as possible. But I was really, you mentioned task shifting, which is a big buzzword at WHO now and, and it's strongly recommended. Uh, nurse, nurses um, and, and, and at different levels from midwives to public health nurses. Nurses really did the bulk of care uh, at community health centers, and also nurses did most of the attended deliveries, even at, um, at many hospitals. And, they, and the obstetricians played a less, less of a role, partly because uh, they only did emergency and high-risk care, and there weren't that many of them. So the backbone of the health system really was the nurses. The nurses already were familiar and comfortable with drawing blood, so to introduce a rapid HIV test was not that big an issue uh, to do. And then I think that they were very glad that they actually had an intervention that they could offer that was really a strong motivating factor and that they could begin to see the results. But one of the, uh, one of the issues in terms of health care uh, or the healthcare staff is that there is a tremendous drain on nurses and a constant turnover and it was a very common situation to do training and then a year later to have entirely different staff mm -hmm. at the clinics and that was ch challenging. One of the pushes of PEPFAR was to get uh, not only for MTCT but for all of HIV to have that be part of the curriculum for post uh, graduate training and in-service training, but also in pre-service training to be, to have HIV a clear part of the nursing and the medical curriculum so that, and, and nurses knew that in a, whatever job they were going to be dealing, doing, eventually they would also be dealing with HIV, and I think all health workers knew that. There was a special cadre that was developed early on of counselors, and there was a big push for that. I remember one, one anecdote, uh, not an anecdote, but it even became a best practice for a while. Tom Kenyon was the leader in um, the CDC country director in Botswana. And as he was supporting 
the scale up of PMTCT, he basically uh, uh, purchased portable cabins, I think 300 of them, to physically, because space was an issue and confidential space and comfortable space for a, a quick laboratory. So uh, he was able to put cabins um, out at, at almost every health center in Botswana, which is a relatively small country, and to add f comfortable physical space for people to work and do the HIV part of the program, and also to hire uh, counselors to do HIV counseling, because in the early days, uh, bef before counseling was kind of de-emphasized, counseling was really a big part of the program, and there were uh, high demands on it, and that could quickly become a bottleneck or, or a barrier to effective care. You mentioned uh, PEPFAR, we know, was an interagency, multi-agency project, um, and USAID played a big role in PMTCT as well. Um, how, did, how did you and the CDC group around you interact with USAID and country? How did that go? Well, it's, uh, that, that was part of my continuing education and learning to learn more about our uh, different US agencies. And I did not have, uh, didn't have really that much of an appreciation of USAID before and what their, what their roles were um, that were either similar or different from CDC. But USAID, USAID certainly was always very strong in terms of funding support for maternal child health. So they saw MTCT interventions as an important part of their, um, uh, their, their uh, portfolio as well. We developed and were encouraged in the early days of PEPFAR to develop an interagency working group. And I, I headed that for the PMTCT group. And we had uh, monthly calls with USAID and with HRSA and with NIH on the calls to, co to coordinate from different headquarters um, leaders um, our strategy and to go over country by country what we, what we were doing in terms of support. And we tried to have face-to-face -face meetings either once or twice a year. I think that that was one of the, for me, it was really very, very nice in terms of meeting and getting uh, outside of CDC and understanding and working with people coming from different agency backgrounds, different perspectives, uh, then, um, and that was very helpful and understanding the strengths of different agencies. So, uh, we then, there was a mirror of that at the country level, and ideally there were interagency working groups on the, all of the PEPFAR level and within key program areas, and those worked to probably to varying degrees in different countries. I know that when I went to country, I would always try to meet with both CDC and USAID, even if they had were doing different things and were working in different parts of the country or having different partners. But it was very important to not just go as CDC, working only with CDC. We began to uh, work as PEPFAR and um, tried to make it one program and one super agencies super agency. There were a lot of holes in that. There were a lot of breakdowns in that. There were different conflicts and agency agendas. But, but it really was, uh, I think everyone really tried to make that work. And I think the biggest issue was, um, was control over different budgets and, and how much mm -hmm. money CDC would get versus USAID would get in specific countries and who would have control and how to coordinate that. And I think that there were several iterations of strategies that were way beyond my level in terms of deciding how to do that. But, but to come back to the point when we went to country, it was, it, it was, we felt like we had more partners and a more expansive view of things by working with, um, with USAID as well as CDC. Before we uh, move, move to your WHO phase, um, 
things changed in terms of the approach to treating the mothers and, and PMTCT uh, in terms of giving more antiretrovirals first right after delivery and then can you comment a little bit about that? Um, because so as you were doing your initiative, there was a huge steamroller of, of getting ARVs to HIV infected people all over Africa and then Asia. Um, and uh, sort of a big effort, maybe first looking at the most critically ill and then changing the uh, guidelines in terms of what CD4 count people would be eligible. How did, how did that work in the MCH situation over time? And it's still probably continuing. Yes, that really is the crux of the issue. I mentioned before that there were rapid changes in the um, MTCT field in terms of interventions. Uh, and our, our Achilles heel at the time was not being able to provide effective interventions during breastfeeding. We just didn't know whether ARVs were safe, would be well tolerated, both for the mother uh, and, the, and the baby. Uh, but at the, at the same time, there was rapid um, both more research, more proof of the benefit of treatment, and um, more capacity in terms of testing, particularly around CD4 count. So from around 2004 to 2010, in that range, as you say, the emphasis was on identifying the most critically ill people who were felt both to need it for their own health, but also they would be likely to be the highest risk of transmitting HIV, either heterosexually or in some other uh, type of transmission or from mother to child. So, and this was again, one of the challenges and a great barrier was it, it was, it was uh, the premise was you needed to have a CD4 count. You either had uh, assess the patient for signs of clinical AIDS or uh, the, under, the appreciation was we really needed to not just wait till people had fulminant AIDS, but to look at their immunological status and begin to treat them earlier on. So to do a CD4 count and the guidelines were raised progressively from a CD4 count under 200 to 350 to 500 and uh, for adults in general. And this applied also for women. Now at that time, the paradigm was in general that there would be special uh, HIV treatment centers, um, either at the hospital or freestanding. So as, as I was saying, uh, during the time from 2004 to 2010, there was really a um, push in terms of evidence that, um, uh, that people should be treated earlier. Uh, and this was both in terms of evidence and capacity. There were concerns about the cost and how many people would be put on drugs and what the capacity was. Um, but, it was um, but it was really an expectation that more and more people should be uh, put, put on treatment. So mothers, pregnant women, with HIV were really a subset of this. And we came to appreciate more and more that rather than our approach, which had been on prophylaxis primarily for the benefit of trying to prevent an infection in the baby, that really uh, maybe all um, this could converge and um, mothers could, uh, could and should have ART for their own health benefit. And if they got their ART for their optimum health benefit, that in a sense would be the best prophylaxis as well. And it would be a double win to, for their own health, to prevent potentially horizontal transmission to a partner, and also to prevent infection to the baby. So through 2010, which is uh, just, uh, just after I left CDC and went to WHO, we still had guidelines globally that were I think recommending a CD4 count under 500. And we still had separate guidelines for adults and special guidelines for pregnant women with HIV. Because of this um, 
tension or different approach between the optimal prophylaxis versus treatment. The underlying principle was that any mother that needed treatment for their own health should get it, and that would be their treatment and prophylaxis. Otherwise, to do an elegant and long um, prophylaxis intervention for the mother. I, I remember I, a lot of controversy over, over um, what I think was really cost-related, um, what priority should be given to the pregnant mothers in terms of full ART coverage. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I think that went on for a couple of years. Yeah, I think it was uh, really a concern rather than controversy. I think that everyone by this point wanted to provide the best possible treatments. The, but there were two, two concerns. One, was it really feasible in terms of the overall cost? And then the logistical cost, again, we talked about providing interventions to pregnant mothers at point of delivery mm -hmm. as opposed to at special ART centers. So that was an additional logistical call, uh, challenge to think about that. Did were, that. Is that how, did that materialize? Was treatment then given at point of care in many settings, uh, sort of primitive maternal yes. MCH settings? Yes, that was really recognized by 2008, 2010 as really the optimal approach because pregnant women, it was just recognized over and over again, uh, and understandably so, that pregnant women would, um, in their late stages of pregnancy, they would not want to go to an ART clinic, and then the internal medicine doctors or nurses dealing with HIV patients would not be comfortable with a, um, w with a pregnant woman in her eighth month of pregnancy coming, um, and, and the people in the waiting room wouldn't be comfortable. So uh, the ideal approach was to provide the ART in the decentralized settings. But this also fortunately dovetailed with the idea that ART, as it became more available, would also be decentralized and uh, it wouldn't necessarily be in the maternity, but in smaller facilities, it would actually be at the same facility. Mm -hmm. But f women didn't, uh, it, it, was, it was unrealistic to expect them to be going back and forth to different clinics, sometimes over long distances. The other concern at the time, which was really still a significant concern and then continues to be with some of the drugs that we're using now as we change to newer drugs is what is the safety of drugs for uh, which we could be fairly confident of their safety for adults on treatment but for a pregnant woman and her newborn what was the added safety assessment of the uh, safety profile of those drugs uh, for, for pregnancy and that was an ongoing uh, concern, both in terms of nevirapine, in terms of efavirenz, and other uh, uh, other drugs. You you've mentioned in passing stigma. Um, was that a major challenge uh, with regard to getting pregnant women to agree to HIV testing, uh, getting them on treatment? Um, having to disclose to their partners and so on. So we, we were covering a span here of 2003 to 10 and things changed quite a bit. But can you mention that? Sure. Uh, we, we, we've always been very cognizant of that, but I think it's one thing to be intellectually cognizant and another to really appreciate the dynamics at the local level, there are a lot of different, or at the country level, there are a lot of different issues, and I really can't pretend to uh, uh, to be so familiar or characterize them, but we, we really were very concerned about stigma. On one simple level, the issue of uh, um, what was the attitude of healthcare workers towards patients, in this case, pregnant women, who tested positive. So we, uh, we might assume that healthcare workers would be very supportive of their patients, but that isn't necessarily always the case. And there isn't 
uh, we, uh, isn't the same level of communication and openness that uh, we sometimes take for granted in our interaction with our healthcare providers in the U.S. So, uh, so one is what was the attitude of healthcare workers and they, did they stigmatize their HIV positive patients? There wouldn't be that kind of stigma in an ART clinic which was dedicated to providing support, but in a more general setting where you had this special problem, um, uh, that, that was an issue. Now, um, there was also a particularly, we, we were talking about this with small communities and traditional birth attendants, uh, what is known about uh, how is the community going to look at mothers that are HIV positive. And this, again, comes back to the breastfeeding issue. Breastfeeding is the norm. It's very encouraged and uh, is good for the health of the baby. Uh, with our early guidance to avoid breastfeeding or to stop breastfeeding after a short period of time for HIV positive women in Africa, that was difficult to do and in potentially invited stigma because it just was an open signal that women who weren't breastfeeding probably had HIV, mm. and that was a concern. Now, at the same time, I think because uh, HIV was not just testing for HIV, but there was more and more treatment in general, and it wasn't just treat, uh, there wasn't just a program for pregnant women, but it was for co-infected patients with TB, it was for the general population. Over time, I think HIV was becoming destigmatized or normalized in a general way, and there was truly excitement that some real interventions in ART would be available. And I think more than anything, that really helped destigmatize because it was something that could be done. One of the outstanding efforts in the MTCT field was an initiative that came out of South, South Africa that was called the Mother to Mother Program which was, to, it was started by an NGO to develop, uh, to enlist mothers that had gone through the MTCT program to then hire on, on some small stipend to be uh, advocates for patients and to work alongside the healthcare workers to basically buddy up with new HIV positive women coming through the MTCT program. So the Mother to Mother program was an adjunct to both kind of empower, give recognition and support to positive mothers who had gone through the program, were dealing with their own difficult circumstances, and recognize that they could then make a contribution mm. to help others. And that was really, that, 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 that was a very exciting program and is still being used in many countries. And um, mm. part of the model of enlisting um, adjuncts or additional community people as part of the whole healthcare effort to respond to HIV. Well, I want to leave just a few minutes to talk about your work after you left CDC and moved to WHO uh, in 2009. And can you tell us a little bit about your position there and what were some of the, the key advances and changes in guidelines sure. regarding PMPCT? Sure. Uh, while I was very enthusiastic about my work and the continued prospects at PEPFAR, uh, I had an opportunity to go to WHO to be the PMTCT team leader there uh, in Geneva and I moved there in the middle of 2009, and I had already been working closely with WHO on guidelines. I, re I mentioned that there were guidelines updates like every two years, and um, uh, I s appreciated the role that the guidelines played and, and the power of those guidelines when you went to country. It was one thing for CDC and PEPFAR to say, here's our recommendation, but ultimately, country ministries of health looked to the WHO guidelines to make their decisions. 
uh, and, and wanted to keep up with that. So I saw that there was an opportunity to have an impact in terms of guidelines, and there was excitement with that. So the, very, very briefly, there were two sets of guidelines that, that I was very involved with, 2010 guidelines and then 2013-2015 um, uh, guidelines. And the 2010 guidelines uh, were, in retrospect, um, it was kind of the last gasp of guidelines that had separate mother guidelines mm. and treatment guidelines. And we were still in the interplay between the two. And the guidelines were in advance forward in terms of, of expecting a higher level of intervention, but they were uh, ultimately, I think, confusing and also disappointing to uh, people that really began to see that the only way that we could have uh, better protocols for treatment would be to uh, treat all people. And again, this came back to the cost, the feasibility, the safety. We weren't really there yet with the evidence and the all the support for it, but everyone began to anticipate that this is really where we were going and we had to uh, but if we could really get to treating all people, including pregnant women, that would simplify the whole approach and also join up pregnant mothers as just one subset of, of, of adults and all people living with HIV. So soon after our first guidelines came out in 2010, we really began working on um, looking towards treating all, and again, avoiding the barriers of having to require a CD4 test or a viral load test before starting treatment because that just was a real limitation. And uh, countries like Malawi took the initiative on their own. Um, they really rejected the WHO 2010 guidelines and said, no, we're gonna do something different. This is just not feasible for us. You have a nice guideline on paper, but we are very poor. Uh, limited country, we cannot implement these guidelines as our standard of care. And they, they pioneered what came to be called the B plus uh, for, uh, for mother to child transmission where all pregnant mothers living with HIV would get lifelong treatment. And uh, they would start that as early as possible in the pregnancy and they would continue during breastfeeding and continue breastfeeding. Uh, and then transition to lifelong treatment. And that, so I worked very much with Malawi. We had interim guidelines in 2013. And then with a lot of support from PEPFAR, which also was very, very um, interested, obviously, in what the WHO guidelines were. And it was a kind of a two-way. PEPFAR uh, really was enthusiastic and pushing for treating all. And uh, on the other hand, WHO needed to uh, have assurance that the Global Fund and PEPFAR and other groups would really support um, the funding for, for treating all and, and, and was that feasible. And PEPFAR also needed to make sure that if these guidelines came out, that the world did not expect that PEPFAR would support all of the treatment funding. But the most important thing in terms of the guidance itself uh, based on the evidence and the, um, and the logistical feasibility. By 2015, the, the guideline at WHO came out that all adults should be treated with lifelong treatment as early as possible, including pregnant women. And this was part of what WHO called a consolidated guideline to bring everything together. I think that was a, a big step forward. And so it was an exciting time to be part of those uh, guidelines. I was glad to, very, very glad to be there. At the same time, just to uh, add one more note, we began to think about a new concept of EMTCT, or elimination of mother to child transmission. And so thinking back, we went from the very early years um, many investigators and myself of simply looking at risk factors for MTCT, mother to child transmission. And then we put the P in front of it, PMTCT, when we had some 
increasing opportunities for prevention of mother to child transmission. In some countries, they called that um, parent to child transmission rather than focusing only on the mother. But then we realized by around 2012, 2013, that some countries really were, even in high burden countries, already had very successful programs and were lowering the transmission rate down from a background rate of about 30, 35%, down to around 5% or less. Uh, and really had extremely successful programs, were testing more than 95% of their pregnant women for HIV, were providing interventions, and it was very exciting and we were, and, and actually CDC, I was no longer there, but CDC as part of PEPFAR was doing some early impact studies to demonstrate the uh, actual measurable effect of this in terms of transmission and infections, not just relying on models, but actually seeing infections prevented and infants who were clearly uninfected. So we developed the concept of uh, a framework for EMTCT that WHO is continuing to lead in, in countries. Currently, this applies mostly to countries that uh, have lower prevalence, but there is, um, as part of the framework for this, there's something called a path to elimination for the high burden Africa countries. So it's not just waiting until you have a super successful program to get certified for that, but that you have benchmarks along the way so that very high burden countries can be recognized for achieving certain milestones along the way on the path to elimination. And it's both a galvanizing um, uh, advocacy tool, but really a recognition tool. One of my very proud moments as part of EMTCT, um, uh, as part of this framework, and I'm still on the advisory committee for WHO for EMTCT, is Thailand was the first country in Asia to be certified for EMTCT. So uh, really rather, rather remarkable from our placebo-controlled, our natural history studies and placebo-controlled studies in the middle 1990s, and by 2016 or 2017, uh, Thailand was fully certified as having eliminated mother-to-child transmission now, this is not eradication, but this is eliminating it down to a very low-level public health program. And now Thailand, um, as is true to their form, they've, while they've clearly achieved the benchmarks for EMTCT, they, they want to go further and they're pushing the bar and they expect in the next two years to show even more progress with this. So this is something I'm continuing to work on a bit on the side. What a great way to end. Thank you so much. Th thank you very much.